Hi, and welcome back. This is Disability Saves the World with Dr. Fadi Shenouda. I am Fadi Shenouda. This podcast brings you insights from leading experts in disability and math studies from around the world. You'll hear about the research and work of disabled scholars, activists, artists, and our allies. You'll also get some insight into their lives, their favorite non-DS activities, hobbies, and adventures. Most importantly, you'll hear how they think disability can save the world. My name again is Fadi Shinuda. I use he, him pronouns, and I identify as a fat, disabled, cis man of color. In today's show, I am joined by Dr. Eliza Chandler, Assistant Professor of Disability Studies at Ryerson University. Eliza uses she, her pronouns and is the co-director of Bodies in Translation, one of the largest grants awarded to studying disability and art in Canada, and which brings together over 70 artists and academics from across the country. I got to speak to Eliza about this project and other things that are of interest to her back in May. I'm excited to speak to Eliza to talk to her about her work. And I've been working in quite a bit, which is mostly called Crippy in the Arts, and, and that can refer to conversations or approaches to making arts and culture accessible. Her life outside of academia. Thinking really sort of specifically to this moment, where we're also in day, I don't know, 80 of um, COVID quarantine, but I've been um, going for a nightly walk. It's so funny that Every night around 7 30, I get so excited to go for my nightly 45 minute walk to a dollar round. You know, it's funny how life goes. If you told me that I'd be excited about walking the dollar round a year ago, I wouldn't have always do about that. <laughs> and to ask her how she thinks disability can save the world. Hi, Liza. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks, Sadie. Great to be here. And so excited to have you. Um, we've worked together uh, a bit over the years. You, I, I think you were one of the people who taught me how to teach. So um, I think it's, it's wonderful to have you on this, to not just talk about teaching potentially, but also the other many things that you're involved in. And so I want to get right into it by... Um, uh, you know, jumping into segment one, what I like to call um, inside the project, the work, uh, the art, the research. Um, I want to know how did you get involved or come across disability studies, math studies? You know, I, I was born disabled, but, um, but I, I really didn't find disability arts, activism, and scholarship until later in life. Maybe. Um, about 10 or 15 years ago, I think, after I graduated from my undergraduate degree. And I sort of found all of those things together at once when I took a course at UP with um, Dr. Rachel Gorman. Um, and it was called Disability Arts and Activism. And it really, the title of the course really spoke to me as the one who was disabled someone who was an artist and someone who was increasingly interested and curious, I would say, about disability activism. Um, so I signed up and then I sort of learned about all of those things together, which for me was really transformative in into how I understand my identity, my own place in the world. Um, it helped me refine my politics. And it helped me think about my art that I was making um, a little bit different, quite a bit differently, I would say. So all of those things um, came together at once. And of course, together with that began, began um, the emergence of a strong line of analysis that was sort of passed on to me by uh, Rachel and, and other disability scholars, study scholars and activists. And, I think together those sort of tentacles of disability culture really helped shape my understanding of myself and the in the world significantly. So your way into disability was really through this course, but but specifically through art. Yes, yes, it was. 
And so that's like a very kind of unique way of entering, I think, disability studies. So you're currently the first person who's talked about like entering disability studies throughout on the podcast. Um, I think people often come to it through like language or through discourse or through those kinds of things. So what was what was your impression of disability art before the course? Oh, um, I mean, to me, before the course, the words disability and art really didn't go together. Um, okay. And I think my undergrad is in fine art. Um, and I think probably the only time that those two words came together in that degree was in reference to outsider art or art group um, thinking about how disabled people make art as, as therapeutic and as um, as something that might be interesting or compelling to look at, but but outside of any formal claiming, um, political intention, or even creative agency. So before the class, you know, I would never place locate myself as a disability artist because of sort of the ableist inferences in in the ways that I was taught to think about the intersection. Right, of course. Um, so I wonder um, if there is a topic or a project that you wanted to talk about today. Um, is there um, something that you wanted to like introduce to folks? Um, it could be bit, of course, the, the kind of huge project that you're on, or it might be you know something else that you want to talk about. I think I'd like to talk about um, a component of bit, which is. So this is a research stream that I've been working on quite a bit, which is loosely called Cripping the Arts, and, and that can refer to conversations or approaches to making arts and cultural arts and culture accessible. Um and maybe introduce the new ways that I'm thinking about how we might crip the arts. Okay, so uh how did you come about to this idea of cripping the arts. The idea of cripping the arts is really a collective um, conversation. I can remember the conversation that led to that word. Um, I was working in Tangled at the time, and Tangled is a disability art gallery, an art gallery in Toronto. Um, but when I started working there, it was a disability organization that sort of developed into a gallery. And at the time, I was working there with a bunch of folks, including Lindsay Fisher, Kara Eastcott, and Katie McMillan. And we were discussing our plans for an upcoming symposium and trying to figure out a name for the, for the symposium. And the name that we eventually came up with was Grouping, Grouping the Arts. And the reason for that was because we sort of understood um, that phrase is referring to a few different things. One, of course, disability arts and creating accessible art and creating art through a disability politics, centralizing that politics, but um, wider or broader thinking about how the how the presence of disability art and our cultural practices changes um, the art milieu overall. So how we we actually lead with our own um, artistic and cultural practices to productively disrupt how how people create, exhibit, and experience art overall. So when I talk about creating the arts in class or or something like that. I always talk about how crypt is um, one of those words that can, can be used in so many ways as nouns and verbs. Um, but the way that I think it's, it's um, described best in this context is cripping as a verb um, based on Kelly Fritch's um, definition of to grip as being to open up with desire. Um, so the ways that disability disrupts. And I think I like that so much because um, it really speaks to the anti-assimilationist core of disability politics, which really is not about trying to 
to fit into the normative way art and culture is created and disseminated, but but leading with this difference, recognizing that the presence of disability is disruptive and um, that's not a disruption to be excluded. It's not a disruption to be tolerated, but it's a disruption to be embraced um, and to think about how that changes disability, arts and culture in a way that centralizes disability experiences and politics. So, so that's sort of the, the, the umbrella of, um, of sort of a lot of different conversations and, and processes that, that lots of folks have been working with over the years. You know, and I think, um, to me, this, this idea of proving the arts is an old one. Um, it can also, it also has resonance with which with how Catherine Fruzzi, sort of a formative um, leader in disability studies and rights and, and arts and culture in Canada. And, and I'm paraphrasing her um, here, but when she's asked what disability arts are, or when she's asked to define disability culture, she says that disabled people um, shape and sh create culture and stretch it beyond its cutting edges. Um, and again, that speaks to the anti-assimilationness, anti non-conformist nature of what we're doing. And I think that is political because when we, when we try to include disabled people in a way that doesn't disrupt, then we're only including a police a particular kind of disabled person. Um, those who can easily fit into um, into artist, artistic spaces. And um, much of my thinking around this has been guided by disability justice activists and thinkers who are in disability that justice activism is activism by and for Black, Indigenous, and people of color, BIPOC, disabled folk. Um, and Liam Mangus talks a lot about um, the anti assimilationist politic of disability justice, specifically when she's talking about accessibility. And um, so in, in a blog post, which is a transcript of a talk that she gave, called um, Changing the Framework, she talks about how our project should not be joining the rights of the privilege, but it should be disrupting the um, system to, that maintain that, that those privileges. And I think that's really the only way that we can achieve inter, intersectional disability justice um, and disability social justice and, and liberation. Um, and I use those terms as a white person who's not contributing to disability justice because it's not my project, but it's a project that I'm indebted to for its really transformative ways of thinking about achieving liberation. But I think recently, um, you know, fortunately, because of, of the um, activism of Folks like Michelle de Cotnies, Rose Jacobson, um, the late Catherine Murphy, uh, Catherine Fuzzi, um, Catherine Church, all kinds of um, disability artists and activists in, in Canada. Particularly, I would say Michelle de Cotney, who has a really good understanding of the funding structures of the arts in Canada has been able to do some really effective advocacy, um, first at the federal level, but it's trickled down um, to provincial and municipal arts funding since I would estimate 2012, maybe a little bit later, deaf and disability arts has begun appearing on the agenda of um, all of those councils. So suddenly, um, being a, dis a disabled led 
organization like Tangled um, put, um, made it advantageous to getting our funding. Um, and then in Canada, you know, I don't see this often about Canada, but we are lucky um, in so many ways for Canada's deeply fraught colonial imaginary, but in, in this one particular way, I think we are lucky in this country that our arts are funded um, federally. Just as an aside, I was listening to something, something on the radio the other day about the deep impact that COVID has had on our galleries and organizations worldwide. An estimate of 13% of all galleries worldwide have closed in the last six weeks and they're not without plans of reopening. And um, the interviewer, the interviewee was saying that's not the case in Canada because we're, we're the arts are federally funded, are governmentally funded, and and we see we see lots of um, COVID relief pa stimulus packages coming through the the arts funding. So that's an aside. I think in in that case we are we are um, fortunate to live in in a place that that funds the arts so significantly. Um, and part of that arts funding now is is to um, deaf and, dis and disability arts organizations, projects, and individual artists. And because of that funding, and because of advocacy on the part of disabled people to make that funding accessible to folks when we're on o the Anterior Disability Support Program or other, other um, welfare state programs like that. And, the advocacy has been that that if you receive an arts grant and you receive that funding, that that funding is not taken away or not clawed back, and that was a real win um, that um, disabled folks achieved a few years ago. So, so because of of this funding, we we've, we've seen a rise in disability arts and and the showcase of different disability arts, and that's fantastic. Absolutely, yeah. Um, but what what I've noticed and what you know, people are tangled and work on art and build propagation and other arts organizations across the country have noticed is that because there's funding attached to our cultural production, there's increased interest in what we're doing. Mm. So people suddenly are phoning and wanting to collaborate and partner and and program um, disabled artists, um, and you know, I think, I think, strikingly, there's a separation between disability arts, even accessibility, and disability politics, right? And so we we used to have this this thing entangled. You can't have our art without our politics because that really was sort of, a, we felt like people were scooping up our, our, our programming and then not committing to things like accessibility, right? Um, not, not putting their, their budget towards accessibility or not, um, not thinking about what it would mean to program, say, a spoony artist and, and give them two weeks or a month or even longer as their installation period to allow for half hour work days or whatever. And, and in that example of how, you know, a gallery might typically have a one day installation window. And if you expand that one day window to a few weeks, you can see how that would disrupt um, a neoliberal clock or an exhibition calendar in a way that contradicts neoliberal values of more and more and more and more, more. So coming back to what Mingus and Prezi and others have said, you know, this is disruptive. Hiring a disabled artist potentially should be disruptive to how you've been programming how you've been budgeting, how you've been working out your timeline. 
Um, and so often we see real examples of how this disruption is too much, and those artists are are sort of um, they're uh, they're altogether excluded. Uh, just to give one example of something that I thought was a beautiful um, amendment to this ableist attitude, um, there's there's an artist in Toronto, Gloria Swan, who was curating a show entangled on um, black, mad, and disabled experiences, and, and the show was called Hidden. It, it happened um, in fall 2019. And one of the exhibitions was an empty space, and she wrote about how she was holding space for artists who were meant to contribute to the show, but because of trauma and crises that was happening, that were happening in their lives, they simply couldn't produce. And I thought, what a beautiful response to honoring honoring that work. As be a work, um, with, instead of just sort of plastering over or sort of filling the space for that that artist um, would have been, but to invite audience members to reflect on that artist, to honor that artist, uh, and and to reflect on the real material conditions of the art world that make it impossible for so many of us to participate. And the artist was paid an artist fee by Tangled, like, so they were compensated in real ways. And I thought that was a great response to, to, to embracing that disruption. Absolutely. You know, what I'm, what I'm learning from hearing you speak is that Cripping the arts to me is so much more than just like the outcome or the products or how they're displayed or, or, you know, where they end up going, but it's all about the process, right? And all about the behind the scenes of like the art world, right? And how much all of it requires like a new system, a new structure, one that is considerate of like the artist, their body, their capacities, their limitations all of those things and so it's it's uh, to me it's so interesting to think about art beyond the thing that ends up on the wall or in the video or you know in its 3d form right and to think about process which is of course is what we hear all the time from artists right it's like all about the process um, um and so it's great that the project is going way beyond right just what ends up uh in the end right it's like it's so fully engaged in the whole from A to from A to Z, really. How's the sound, Katie? It's good. Yeah, that's great. Um, that's exactly sort of what, what excites me about the project, and and particularly why what one of my favorite things about the bodies in translation work is how closely it works with with. Um, on the ground practitioners like Tangled. So Tangled is a community partner um, in that work. And we've been able to flow, I, I'd say a significant portion of our grant budget to Tangled and as well as develop things like um, artists in residencies in place of postdoctoral fellowship. So, so to use that academic funding to meaningfully support um, CARPAC fees, which is the Canadian standard for artist fees, and, and to, to sort of listen to Tango about what they need and provide that in, in exchange or in um, re reciprocal relations. What we gain from that relationship is learning about these, as you say, behind the scenes. Um, practices that are that are always emerging in response to the world in which we live and I think transforming that world as well. I think a great example of that transformation is our our past um, artist in residence, Vanessa Dion Fletcher, who who had who um Vanessa's an indigenous Potawatomi and Lenape disability artist who had a show at Tangled. And 
because of that, Carol really made her work accessible and is now doing a lot of advocacy work into how to ensure that all the galleries that host her um, support the accessible elements of her show, which, I mean, that's really important work as well. But coming back to the relationship between tango, between bodies in translation and organizations like Tangle, I think it really is a multi-directional flow mm. because um, I think academics and scholarship has have a lot to bring um, to the arts. So I, I, of course, there's so much that the arts bring to, to scholarship and and I, I believe that we have to engage the arts in real arts-based research, not arts-informed research, but really sort of follow the arts. Um, I think this is what Jenna Reed, I think a past guest of yours, who, who call studio-based research. So it really is about supporting the arts and the arts comes first. Um, but I think scholarship has a lot to bring arts and cultural practices. I know that when I worked in Tangled and when I speak to lots of arts workers, work, they're so busy doing the work and um, and putting on the, the exhibits and all of these things that there yeah. maybe isn't the time uh, required to sort of think about these practices in relation to a vernacular or theory or a can a developing canon or anti canon of accessibility art. Yeah, I love I love that relationship. Like it's that it's relational, right? In the first place, right? There there's kind of both of them contributing to each other, the art and academia. And I do, like I've said before, I love that there are people who are sitting there thinking about, right, these ideas, uh, because I think that is valuable for someone to, you know, to sit there and think about something for five or six years, right, to develop deeply in it, to, uh, to, to kind to of swim in it. Yeah, yeah, and to make, to make connections, like, like that, and that's the benefit of being able to sort of assume the scopic perspective of everything that's going on because when you're in the weeds and you're sort of doing the day-to-day -day yeah. programming as someone like Sean Lee is doing um yeah I mean you don't really have the benefit of of thinking what's happening globally that's great let's jump into segment two what I like to call um the middle or the liminal space uh I want to ask you who is your academic crush I I think right now my academic crush with with all the consent that hopefully requires is um is Amy Hamry is a disability <laughs> studies um scholar working out of uh, the Vanderbilt University also is the director of um the the Contra podcast maybe a a relation to you maybe in your Save the World podcast. Yeah, um, hopefully. Yeah. Um, and um, I discovered Henry's work, um, which um, in 2017, they wrote a book called Building Access um, Universal Design and the Politic of Disability. And I discovered that book, but, you know, relatively late. I discovered it last year in 2019. And it's one of those books that when I read it, it, it just gave, it just sort of confirmed feelings of discomfort that I've been having, gave yeah. me a, a way to articulate it, but also the incredible work that Henry does puts, puts lots of these theories and practice into historical perspectives, which to me helps me speak to, to lots of the issues that I've been feeling, which I consider broadly char characterized as, as trouble with inclusion, trouble with include, inclusion discourse and practices. Um, so when I, when I speak to that trouble, I, I think it's, really, it's speaking to some of the things we were talking about in the first segment of the podcast with the trouble that um, 
coping the arts can bring, which is a desire for disability arts without a desire for our politics. And this is a lot of times. So, so what Henry Henry offers um, an articulation or framework of critical access studies, and I won't sort of paraphrase your work at length here, but I would encourage people to to check out the book if, if you can, um, because it's, it's excellent. But sort of in broad strokes, what what they sort of demonstrate and argue is that historically disability activism has always been an anti-assimilationist practice. So thinking about folks who um, who left the institution during the long period of the institutionalization, who suddenly found themselves in in a in a grossly inaccessible world. So fights for accessibility had to be anti-assimilationist. Like inclusion, it wasn't about inclusion, it really was about disruption. Because um because including rants and other leaders and push buttons and all these things really did fundamentally disrupt um, public space architecture, um, practices, hiring, all of these things. Um, and you can see that in the activist techniques that lots of folks during the 70s and 80s as part of the independent living movement in, in Canada and in the US and across the world engaged in acts of civil disobedience, tying wheelchairs to inaccessible buses and, and things like that. And what the what Henry sort of traced throughout the book is that what began as a radical process um, led to the achievement of accessibility legislation. So in the states that was the the um American Disability Act in Canada. Later, we have um, the Accessibility Ontario for Ontario with Disability Act here in Ontario and emerging the federal act as well. And so the, these activist projects led to an efforts and direct action led to, to the passage of these, of these laws. But then something sort of interesting happened which was in order to get businesses and other public spaces, governments to comply with these laws, the argument had to be made um, that accessible design was better for everyone. And that's sort of the crux of this universal design approach. Yeah. yeah. And we and when you think about that, um, it happens everywhere. And and disability scholars like Christy Olivierd and um, Stephen Goodley, Tony Tchaikovsky, Carla Rice, all sort of talk about the the, the project of the human as being essentially um, um, able. So this idea of what is a, a, a full human or a proper human is created through an enablist notion of what what a human is. Yeah, and I I think that really maps nicely onto Hammer's work on because when we think about universal design as being accessible for all, that the way that, that all gets categorized, I think defaults into enableist understanding of who that all is. And unintentionally or not, um, the disability experience gets alike. And to me, reading that and sort of seeing that how seeing that position is, is positioned is historically, just this idea that what started out as radical has now become distilled into this project of inclusion and sort of silently or undisruptively being assimilated into the all into the norm, so that the norm can carry on as it is. I mean, it just makes so much sense. Um, and, you know, I can, and that really maps on to uh, ways that I myself have tried to think 
things like that as well. So mm -hmm. an example of that would be the last iteration of the Equipping the Arts Conference, which was held in 2019. We did quite a bit of work um, with Soul Express, which is a, a disability arts organization in Toronto who works with uh, neurodiverse folks and folks who are labeled with intellectual disabilities. And Soul Express came to the first group in the arts. Um, and the, afterwards, one of the, the artists um, approached me and said, you know, great conversation, but it would have been helpful to, to have some time to sort of um, learn what some more of these jargony words meant. And it wasn't as though, for example, the phrase gender neutral. Lots of the artists in that group identify as people who, who require gender neutral washrooms, for example. And um, so, so the, the concept, the idea is right there, right there in their, in their everyday experience and their understanding of the world. But the, the word that we attribute to that is very specific to an academic community. So it's, it's sort of about making the conversation accessible by giving people time to familiarize themselves with a, with a very specific vernacular. So in response to that um, feedback, we worked with that group um, to create a visual story in the plain language version of, of the, the program by doing things like creating a glossary of terms or we sort of often plain language definitions of, of work uh, of words and also provided things like definitions of what a panel is how you can ask questions that we might serve in that lens is free just things that you know i when it goes to conferences know the one is probably free but it's sort of oh, Sickening to think that somebody might not be eating lunch because they, they assume they have to pay for it. And you know, right. so it's so easy just to sort of make that clear. So we created this, this visual story to make the symposium accessible for all. I think with good intention. And then the folks came, came up to, and we worked with Soul Express to, to do this with them. Human centered design workshops and testing and stuff like that, prototyping. But then all the people who came up to me in the symposium with, you know, and we gave the visuals, we gave everyone both copies of the program. So many academics came up to me with their visual guide in hand saying, this, this is great, it's, it's better for everyone. And reading Hamley's work sort of made like I, those comments kept ringing in my ear as like what does that mean like and what who what does that mean for the youth what was my initial intention in creating that document it was really to try to give people access into an inaccessible way of delivering information. We weren't changing the words we were using. We weren't changing the format of, of conversation. We weren't fundamentally thinking about how to dismantle these ableist structures. We were simply creating a guide to give people access into it. And ultimately, what ended up happening is that guide was useful for people who already felt like they had permission that they were the anticipated guests of this symposium, you know, and I think. Well, what, a, what a wonderful like story and explanation of, uh, uh, yeah, like, you know, I, I can imagine someone saying, oh, not only does this help people or might help people with intellectual or developmental disabilities, but it also helps students who, this is the first time they go to the conference, right? Yes. But both yeah. of those things are about fitting people into like pre-arranged or pre-constructed ways of doing conferences, right? Of doing symposiums. And what you're suggesting is that there's an all completely alternative way 
of doing things, right? Like a panel doesn't necessarily have to be what of the way that we deliver information, right? Oh. Um, you know, greetings don't have to be the way that we greet each other. You know, discussions certainly shouldn't be the way that they are, right? Even how horrible discussions are at conferences or question exactly. and answer periods. Like there's, there is, disability offers us this opportunity to disrupt conference spaces or symposiums uh, where, where it's not for all, it's specifically for the inclusion of disabled bodies or bodies of difference or, or people who are mad or people who are deaf or people who are blind. And I think there's one quick sort of um, postscript note to the story. Um, is I, so returning to my academic crush, Amy Hamry, they also write a lot about queer techno science. Um, and, and one of the themes that they work with in, the, in that work is this idea of um, hacktivism or queer tinkering. So yeah. ways that, that we as queer use technologies in ways other than uh, other than their intended use. Um, so, you know, I want to sort of conclude that story about the visual guide by saying I, I did notice that folks um, with neurodiverse folks for, within and outside of Soul Express were using that visual guide in ways that were completely different mm. than we intended. So there was one person, I won't identify them, but but we were sitting together and I saw them. There were pictures in that visual guide and they, they used those pictures as ways to identify people um, in the crowd, but also, and I think that was sort of our hope, but also to bring those people to their table to show them a picture of themselves. So in a way, um, the pictures in the guide, and then, you know, this person has the guide mm. and you know the guide is probably you know pretty much useless to them although they weren't very engaged in, in everything but the one where the guide was useful was just to facilitate these introductions in a very productive way and by the end they had lots of people sitting around them which was exactly what they wanted i i, I think judging by their reaction so, you know, it, it goes to show that despite, you know, how fraught that project might have been, crypt and our, you know, innovators, like, yeah. they're used to things not working and, they, and we're used to hacking them in ways that make it, make it work for us. Absolutely. So um, Amy Henry's book, again, is called A Building Access universal design and the politics of disability. And uh, I think your love for their work runs deep. So um, yeah. I know having read some of their work myself, it's also like, uh, it's a fantastic book and uh, I'm glad you're introducing it to the, to the people on the pod. So I wondered if we move on to the next question, I wonder what advice you might have for younger academics or even students. We constantly talk about in disability studies and as disabled scholars, is how to sort of hack our way through academia. Mm -hmm. It's no secret to anyone um, that academia is deeply ableist and how it's set up. We know from J.A. Dolman's work and others, Margaret Price, that you know, the way academia is set up is, is to reward um, you know, people who can perform within this neoliberal system and and to sort of punish or exclude, exclude people who can't. So I would say that my advice is, is to find those communities, those mentors, and those ways of working that, that hack the system um, and, and to try to use those hacks, to amplify those hacks to potentially make systemic change. Um, so I would say, one practice that I've really benefited from is through working with Carla Rice, who's the, the, my co-director on the Body and the Translation um, project, through sort of a feminist crip ethic of, of doing academia. She's always had a real deep practice of collaborative writing. And I think for me, collaborative writing 
is my, for me, is what has saved me in academia. I think it's helped me produce in ways that might be, you know, respected by academia. Although, you know, there's always, you can always publish more, but, but certainly publishing as part of a team is a, it's a more sustainable way for me to, to produce. And it also, you know, infinitely um, um, rises my, so it enriches my thinking to be thinking and writing with a team of people. And often with Carla, it's not just one person, it's it truly is a team. So if we're, if we're writing about somebody's artwork, that team would always include the artist and the curator and, and sort of collect all of these people and to think through together and to think through in ways that work for them. So if we're inviting an artist onto the artist team, they might not write a word, but certainly the way that they think about their work influences how we write about the work. So that's my biggest advice is to find colleagues, whether they're students or RAs or PhD students, if you're a master's student or, or professors or whatever, to sort of form those relationships. And it really is about relationship building and to be really honest about what you what you need and what you can give um, and find people who are who are into that and who will collaborate with you in those ways. And, and I'm speaking about publishing. It also, it works in anything, co-teaching, um, writing grants together, uh, planning events together, things like this. And, and to, to sort of find your people and work with your people. And also be really open to other people as well so that you're not only working with folks who come easily to you or to your social circles for your your um, building your team even if it's just you know an, an author team in a way that's invitational and open and you're looking for different perspectives and and community so that your work becomes um, intersectional enriched intersectorial in all of these ways um, and you know there are absolutely ways that that's recognized within and without outside of academic norms. I mean, I, one of the things that I'm most proud of the Bodies in Translation project is that we wrote that grant application in a really unapologetic way, right? Like we were clear from the beginning that you know, as much as grant writing is always a bit of a fiction, we want. We weren't going to fiction, fictionalize who our partners were and what kind of fees that we would pay them and what our anticipated outputs are and to, to make the case that podcasts are just as important as peer-reviewed articles because they reach different audiences. Yeah, and and truthfully, it's infinitely more fun to write with other oh, people. Absolutely. Like just like you, you should experience joy in your work, right? And, yeah. and part of that is talking to your colleagues and your friends and producing ideas together. Like um, writing can be incredibly lonely. And yeah. so why not do it in a group? Absolutely, it's a way of staying on task, staying interested. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's move on to segment three, outside the project, the research, the work, the art. Who is the most famous person you've met and what was that experience like? My, my mind immediately goes to Eli Clare. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. the most famous, but for me, meeting Eli Clare was certainly the most. Well, I'll admit to you, Katie, and your listeners, that I met him at, um, and Eli Clare is a disability activist, poet, scholar, and writer. And, and um, his book, um, Pride and Shame, Pride and Shame, no. Exile, Pride and, ex Exile and Pride? Exile, I am a student again. So Eli Clare's book, Exile and Pride, 
Disability and Liberation was one of the first books that I read in that in that first course on disability culture. Um, it like is a a white trans man um, with cerebral palsy like me. I'm not trans, but I'm a white cisgender woman with um, CP. So there was a sort of embodied resonance with his work, and and I met him at the Society for Disability Studies, which is a great conference because you sort of get the opportunity to meet these scholars who sort of leading scholars in ways. And um, I was in a bathroom, and there he was. A benefit of gender neutral bathrooms, I'll tell you. And I just burst into tears. Oh and, my I, God. So, and I was trying so hard I just like go back in the stall. Like it was just, it's, I'm not that, you know, I'm not a, a public crier, but I was just overcome with emotion. Just overcome with emotion. Like, what do you do? Like, when this person yeah. you know, has changed your whole life. Is you know washing his hands as I do. Yeah. And of course he was so kind and you know waited until I was able to surf to resurface and we had a nice conversation and, and you know he's just been a great mentor since and and um, I would like to think that we're you know loose friends um, at this <laughs> point um. We certainly have the opportunity to teach together at Ryerson and, and do a few little things together. Um, but yeah, that was that was quite the moment. And what is it like to like meet a hero or meet someone that you're that has inspired you or that is yeah, you know, like you said, like changed your worldview and that they turn out to be like as exceptional as you hope that they yeah, would be. As exceptional, absolutely <laughs> as exceptional. Just humbled and lived in politics yeah. and just such an impressive sort of scholar in the way that his work has evolved and I think for me that's what I want. I never want to be stuck in, in one world view forever. Like I think he really listens to the politics of the day, the younger people who always are the most brilliant and, and sort of has his work has evolved in, in response to his, his work has evolved in a way that evidence is that he's just never done thinking. And I think it's what, what a great model. And also like uh, his capacity to infiltrate like non DS spaces, right? Because his work is accessible because it's so beautiful, right? It's so like written so well that you know, that that it's able to move in spaces beyond like disability studies. Totally. I wonder if you have an obscure fact that you carry around and that you kind of dole out or, um, you know, bring out when there's like a lull in a conversation. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of right now, I'm, I'm, I'm in, I'm back in the period of my life, 2005. I think four or five. Um, when I took that course with Rachel Gorman, which, as I said, was my introduction to disability culture, and the reason I took that course was because I think I told you this story, Katie, before. But the reason I took that course was because I finagled my way into getting a government grant that was only available to retur returning students. And I got the grant before I had any plans to return as a student. So I returned as a student to that to that course just to get the grant. But the grant itself was for a crate stand in Kensington Market. So I before any of this, before I met Rachel, I had a crate stand in Kensington Market. And the name of the crate stand was Mad Crates, which I think is sort of a funny <laughs> anecdote to all of this. The reason it was called Mad Crates is because the, the recipe was from a region in France called Brittany, and and in Britain, um, Mad means good, <laughs> so, mm. so I called it Mad Crates. 
that's so it's not only that you called it mad crepes but mad crips is like so close to oh yeah that's true like, it's like, i haven't thought of that that's... it's like it's so close i know i know crepe has an e at the end of it but like uh, yeah yeah it's just so it close. <laughs> yeah i love that um and that is a very obscure fact um, what are you reading right now? What's on your night, uh, night table or nightstand? Uh, I'm sort of halfway through um, Christine Sharp's Into the Wake, which is a really important book to be reading at this point um, in time. And it's, it's sort of about, um, it's about the geography and the spatial relations of, of um, folks from Africa who are um, transported to America in the wake of ships um, in the transatlantic trans slave trade. And um, a book that I read recently, which I just finished, um, is um, Black Life, um, post BLM um, in Freedom is what it's called, by Ronaldo Wilcott and Adele Aduello. Um, and the work really is um, such a strong articulation of the need for anti assimilationist politics. And one of the things that I really um, have received from that book is this idea that they talk about black gifts, which are, are ways that in Canada we continue to um, perpetuate colonial violence and, and kill black life and, in all kinds of ways, while at the same time, being really excited about black gifts um, and black gifts are things apart from black vitality and and life and and life that we embrace like caravana is is a good example to me of the culture or hip hop culture that that is a Canadian colonial culture we're excited about caravana while sort of committed to, to killing the black lives that, that make that culture possible. Well, um, so I think that's that's a really great book, and yeah. And uh, we're recording this just so people know. Um, I think it's on the fifth or the sixth day of the protests that have been happening in the U.S. And uh, just two days after, or three days after, um, um, Regis was killed in Toronto um, by the police here. So um, we're kind of in the midst of it yet. We don't know when this podcast is going up. So just to let people know the context of our of our statements um i want to ask you about um the thing that you do that brings you joy um is there a hobby or something that you do that um brings you joy and how did you get started in it thinking really sort of specifically to this moment where we're also in day i don't know 80 of um of uh, COVID quarantine, or something like that. Um, something like that. Which it feels like day one thousand. <laughs> <don't think laughs> it it's such an interesting time. So I, you know, we could say so much about this time, but I've been um, going for nightly walks, which is a real, real. I know it's funny. For a while, we were to go. Um, I just moved in into a new house and we've been fixing it up and one of the only stores that have been open through this that had things that we needed were was Dollarama. So it was just so funny that every night we were seven thirty I'd get so excited to go for my nightly forty five minute walk to Dollarama. You know, it's funny how life goes. If you told me that I'd be excited about walking to Dollarama a year ago, I wouldn't have believed you, but that, it's really like a life, a life saving activity at this yeah. point. I mean, uh, like, I think Costco is the new, like, Canada's wonderland because <laughs> it does seem so thrilling to go there now. Really? Like, there's a lineup, there's a really long queue to get in. You know, there's like, there's the, the, the carts or the roller coaster, you know. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. like, it's a like very, and then, like you know, you 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 pay at the end, right? In some way. Pay at the yeah. end, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and of course, I'd like to end as I always do by asking uh, my guests how they think disability can save the world. 
for so many ways right now. It's, I mean, there there are so many ways, so many disability justice activists have been talking a long time for a long time about how disability will save the world. How we're used to we're used to living isolated lives and connecting through alternative means and checking in on people as a daily practice and and thinking about how to adjust to the unknown and sort of unknown timelines and recovery times and just thinking about things like fresh air and different how to get fresh air in different ways and how to access education in different ways how to, how to just sort of reorient your whole life um, on a dime and to keep doing that for an unknown amount of time i think that's something that like crypts do really well um because we've always had to do it um and there's all kinds of examples of how how our practices are are sort of saving the world um are sort of guiding people into practices that that will will give us life at the end of the world i think of again more where we just come off a weekend of protest, Black Lives Matter led protest, um, and Cyrus Marcus Ware, who's a member of the Crips community and, and others, um, did a tremendous amount of work to make sure that the prote protests were live streamed so that we could participate in them without risking our health and our lives to be there in solidarity in person. I think that's just one example of how. A uh, disability can save the world. That's a quick practice that has that potentially allowed so many people to to stay in isolation, um, while being being connected to such an important uh, current event safely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you, Liza. This has been such a wonderful conversation. I really appreciate you coming on. Thanks, ladies. It's been so fun. Thanks to Eliza for coming on the show. Get in touch with us by sending us an email at disabilitysavestheworld at gmail.com. If you're interested in learning more about me, you can check out my website at fadyshenuda.com. This podcast is hosted and produced by me, Fady Shenuda, and now edited by Yasmina Garcia. Thank you for listening and see you next time on Disability Saves the World.